there's never an age that is too young to talk about the things that are relevant to that age. So is it too young at five years old to talk about anal sex? Yeah, probably. Right. Like kindergartners don't need to like know that where they go poo poo is like also a pleasurable, right? Like we, that, and, but that's what people hear when we're like, let's bring sex ed to, to five-year-olds. They're like, we can't teach them about sex toys and anal. Like no one wants that. No one is pushing for that. No one needs that. What we can do though, is teach kids for appropriately for where they are developmentally. Hey, welcome back to Normalize the Conversation. Today, I'm here with Rachel Wright, licensed psychotherapist based in New York City. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited for this conversation. But before we jump in, I just want to check in. How are you really? It's a great question. (laughs) I'm good. I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, I think that all of these topics are incredibly important and I feel honored and excited and privileged to be able to have this conversation with you. Likewise. So let's jump right in. Tell us a little bit about you and your work. Okay. Well, uh, where do I begin? (laughs) Um, so I am, as you said, I'm a licensed psychotherapist. Um, I have always been super interested in human behavior, the brain, and specifically how they relate to mm, relationships and sex. So I still definitely am a psychology nerd and like love learning about anxiety and depression and like all of the other, you know, mental illnesses um, and frankly, emotions that exist in our world. Uh, But I have always been drawn really specifically to how those things then impact our relationship with ourselves, our relationships with other people, uh, our sex lives, you know, figuring out at a very young age by like reading research and taking classes that libido is basically like this check engine light for our whole being and hearing so many people talk about my libido is low, my libido is low. Like, what do I do? I have to do something specifically for my sex drive. And it's like, no, that's an indicator that something in the whole being is going on. And so I've just always had this curiosity about how all these things are linked and intertwined. So I decided to become a sex therapist and educator and um, really use my background that I have in theater to be able to make these conversations more fun and even like crack a smile while you're feeling uncomfortable uh, and really trying to, you know, whether I'm teaching a class of nine to 12 year olds, or I'm teaching a class at a retirement home, um, really meeting whoever is there where they are and giving them accurate and wonderful, fun information to, to take with them and hopefully make their lives better. I absolutely admire that because I don't think there's enough conversations on relationships, on sex, and the connection to mental health. Mm -hmm. I know there are so many different mental health conditions. There's, it can affect your sex drive, it can affect your libido, and people don't know that because we don't talk about it. What do you think are maybe some of the warning signs that it's your mental health is kind of getting in the way? Oh, it's a great question. So we can see it kind of manifest in lots of different ways. The general zoomed out answer is, is there an impairment or a shift in your life that you would perceive as negative in some area? So for example, non-sexually, let's say you are typically very extroverted, you're social, you're motivated, you're excited to, you know, go to work or school or whatever the case may be. And for like, two weeks now, you just haven't felt the motivation or you're feeling really tight and anxious and like afraid to go to your friend's party or, you know, there's something coming up that isn't normally there or something is taken away that is normally there. So like your motivation's gone, um, things like that. Those are really good indicators. And I'm not talking about like oh, I had a bad day or like, oh, I had a fight with my friend. So 
yeah, of course I'm going to be a little bit down today, right? Like th those types of things are different. What I'm talking about is more of a, a longer term and that can be two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. Um, but a longer term thing that feels a little stuck and typically how a lot of these things present, especially in, um, in women is low libido. Um, and this, this is across gender, like any, any, any gender can experience this dip in libido when they are experiencing emotions that are uncomfortable. It is very hard for us to want pleasure and crave pleasure when we're not feeling ourselves and we're not feeling good. Um, so the way that like a relationship conflict or an unhealthy relationship may manifest is low libido. And then that person goes to their doctor, their medical doctor, and is like, help, I have low libido. And they do a blood panel and they're like, you're fine. You're totally healthy. And then this person leaves and they're like, but what the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> like, but I, I used to want sex all the time and now I don't. And so, no, I'm not okay. Like, what are you talking about? And definitely always go to the medical doctor first. Like that's where I send my clients first right away to rule out like a thyroid thing or a hormonal thing. We always want to rule those out first. But the second the doctor says, yeah, you're all clear here. That's where a sex therapist comes in. That is such valuable information because again, it's so common. You do go straight to your medical doctor and you're like, what's wrong? And when they can't give you the answers, I think most people start to feel like they don't know what's wrong with them Yes, and they really internalize it. And it causes more of a spiral that I'm not good enough manifest into relationships where I can't please my partner. I can't yep. be part of this. And it really just so many relationships get ruined by it. So I love that you are providing that information and as a sex therapist, able to support people. So diving into that. What is your role as a sex therapist in helping people overcome this? Oh, well, <laughs> it varies so drastically per client. You know, it's, there's a difference between someone who comes to me that um, had childhood sexual abuse or a sexual assault that is healing from some sort of sexual trauma and is starting to come back into their body and having it feel safe to, to feel pleasure and to be touched in certain areas or on certain areas, that person is going to have a very different experience in, in therapy than let's say someone who has been feeling depressed or anxious. And it's been like six weeks and their libido just started to drop and they've noticed that it's starting to impact their sense of self and their relationship. And they want to explore that just in those, this is only two examples of many, but like those two individuals would have a very different experience. You know, we're going to use different therapeutic modalities and, um, different tools to help that person understand what's going on, heal and move into the world as the, as the person that they want to be and, and feeling how they want to feel. Uh, and I'm really lucky. I, I have founded, I founded a, a company called shame-free therapy and it's a nationwide telehealth service. So I have a lot of therapists and like specialized coaches that actually work for this organization. Um, so for example, I have someone on my team that works specifically around sexual trauma and that is like their focus, their passion. They love everything about it. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody fills out our intake form and they have experienced sexual trauma in their past, I actually give that that client to this person. Um, whereas, you know, maybe if it's exploring, a sexual orientation or releasing shame or anxiety or communication, I may keep that for myself. Um, I also work a lot in non-monogamy. So often, uh, couples will come to me that are opening up their relationship and, you know, doing anything that's outside of our quote unquote norm is anxiety producing and it has shame attached with it. And we have all of these like old programming and thoughts going through our head. And so that's also a way that I will work with people is, you know, releasing shame and shoulds and 
all of these thoughts so that you can show up in the world every day as yourself. That is incredible. First of all, congratulations on creating that company, that organization, making that space available. That space just, again, when you're doing something out of the norm or you've gone through some kind of trauma that people don't understand, it can be so isolating because who do you talk about it to? Right. Where do you go to find information? Google is only so helpful. Right. And you never know. Like, I love Google. I'm the first one to be like, hey, did you Google it yet? Like, (laughs) you know, I'm I'm very pro Google. The thing is, though, that we have to take into consideration that Google is a robot. So not all of the answers that pop up at the top are because they're the most accurate. It's because they have the best SEO, which is search engine optimization. Right. So we as uh, the consumers of the Google (laughs) have to really be smart about parsing through the info that we get after we type something in, Um, which is why I try to give websites and people and things that generally are really on point with their information so that rather than having to type a question to Google, someone will say, oh, I have this question about, I don't know, the fluidity of, of sexuality. Oh, Rachel told me about this Instagram account called such and such. Let me go check their thing for a post on fluidity of sexuality. Right. And then you don't have to use your mental energy to like parse through the SEO nightmare that is Google. And you can just go to a trusted source. Um, and I think that that's one of the benefits of social media. There are obviously a lot of non-benefits. Uh, but one of the benefits is like, there's some really, really incredible, specialized, accurate accounts out there creating great content around this stuff. I completely agree. And finding those social media in the beginning, I was so skeptical of people talking about anything kind of mental health related on social media, because it was a lot of people who just didn't know. And they were like, put on a face mask, like you'll feel better. And it's just, I mean, a face mask can be great. Like I'm all for putting on a face mask after I've been crying. Like it does help. Like I agree, but it's not necessarily the solution. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's one of those, you know, I tell people all the time when they're like, I'll say something, you know, about practicing self-care and they're like, Rachel, but I went for a manicure and I took a bath and I'm not feeling better. And I'm like, okay, let's talk about what self-care actually is. And yeah, these things like, um, attachment theory is one that recently has been all around social media. Uh, there's lots of things that kind of get like trendy for a minute. And it's, it's great in the way of like, now, you know, the term attachment theory, that is cool. Like objectively, that's great. The issue is, is that that was an entire class for a semester in my master's program. And now someone is learning about it in a 60 second TikTok video. And it's like, "Mm, don't think we're going to get the whole point across. Like I, okay. So we need to, you know, asterisk it for ourselves and be like, not the full picture can understand the concept, but you're not going to like become an expert on attachment theory and start being like, oh, because this is, this attachment style is interacting with it. Like, let yourself off the hook. (laughs) Exactly. As someone who just went through theories in my master's program, I can tell you that it's a lot of information. Like you can't learn it in 60 seconds. You can maybe get a little bit of a background on what it is, but also understanding that attachment theory might not be the right theory for you to be kind of analyzed through. Very important. Yes, exactly. And that's why there are so many different modalities. And there are some therapists that like just specialize in one. And then there are some that have a more integrative approach. And for me, the way that my brain works, I, I work very integratively. So it's like, no, oh, these are my favorite tools from CBT. These are my favorite tools from DBT. These are my favorite tools from Gestalt. These are my favorite Gottman tools, right? Like, and kind of like picking and choosing from my toolbox for each person. And that is great for some people. And for mm-hmm. others, if they want a pure, you know, I want to go to someone who is just an expert in attachment theory and is going to help me just with that, like go find an expert in that. And you will learn so much more about it through working with an, a therapist that specializes in that than you will from watching these videos online. 
Exactly. It's so important to find people who specialize and able to understand and actually support you because when attachment theory is at play with your mental health, when it's your attachment, it's very important that you're able to work through that. It's not just, okay, I have a bad attachment because X, Y, Z happened. It's do I genuinely have this attachment and how can I work through it? And what does this mean in my other relationships? Because it does affect more than one relationship in your life. And that's very important to recognize. Yes. That is such a good point because such a good point when, whenever I hear someone uh, reflecting what they've consumed online, it's through a very narrow lens. Like you're saying, so like, oh, I realized that because of my dad, I relate to my partner like this, but what we don't zoom out and see is like, what about your other parents or your grandparents or another, you know, authority figure growing up? And then what about your other relationships? Like it doesn't just show up from parent to romance. And that's something that is again, misunderstood because of these videos. And like, again, I'm really not shitting on the videos. I think that in general, like more knowledge out there is great. I'm the first person to be like, you know, give an inch of what it is and like, let people go explore. And we just have to remember that just like, we don't want to go into our medical doctor's office and be like, so I looked at WebMD and, uh, I fully understand psoriasis and I have psoriasis, right? Like we don't walk in and we may say, Hey, I think based on what I've read, I may have psoriasis. Can you take a look? And then we let the doctor do their job and look at us and say, Oh, no, you don't. Or actually, yes, you do. Great. Wonderful job looking it up. Let's talk about treatment. Uh, but it's important to, you know, take it into your own hands and get the support. Exactly. Researching a little bit on your own and going to the doctor and asking for support and help is so important. And I think it just in today's world has become minimized a tiny bit, not saying that, like you said, the information being out there, the resources, I mean, we're glued to our phones 24 seven, my generation grew up with our iPhones in our hands. So that is where we get most of our information, but recognizing that it's also okay to research it on your own and ask a professional for help is so important. But I really want to switch over to, like you said, shame-free therapy. I think when it comes to sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, there is so much shame. How do we help people kind of recognize that maybe I'm not following this normative culture and I want to start working on it because I just, I think there's so much shame in people wanting to explore, explore themselves nowadays. Agreed. And it's really, I wish it were the opposite, you know, because of exactly what you just said with phones being in your generation's hands from day one, like you would think that that would normalize things that weren't the quote unquote norm before, right? So normalizing body diversity, normalizing racial diversity, normalizing gender diversity, like all of these things in theory could release shame by being able to see so many different people that when I was a kid, I didn't have access to, you know, I I had my neighbors and the kids at school. Like I I didn't have social media until college. Well, I guess I had a MySpace in high school, but now I'm dating myself, but like, you know, really, I mean, Facebook came out when I started college. So I truly did not grow up. I would not say I grew up with social media. MySpace was the closest thing. Um, So in terms of releasing the shame, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that these quote unquote norms that we're talking about in our country specifically are norms, and I'm using big air quotes, are white, cisgender, heterosexual, monogamous. Now, that is some, those are some people (laughs) in our country. In my circles, that's not the norm. In many circles around the country, that is the norm. And what happens when we say the norm is what that's short for is normal. So our brain hears anything outside of those things is abnormal. And that has a negative association with it. 
Now, if we're talking strictly scientifically, we know it has no judgment, right? So like researchers may say, oh, the norm of this, the results of the study, most people fall between these numbers. And it's just objective. It doesn't mean anything. But in our society and in our culture, normal and abnormal have meaning behind them and they have judgment behind them. So I think the first thing is acknowledging that what is the quote unquote norm doesn't mean that it's normal. It just simply means that that has been the majority for a chunk of time. Now, the reasons why that's the majority we can get into and are really fucked up, right? And like, there are all sorts of things that we could unpack there, but simply naming, if I don't fall into these quote unquote norms, that does not mean that I am abnormal. What it means is, is that you just don't fit into those things. And like, that's wonderful and beautiful. And we need more of that. You know, the reason why the percentages of the LGBTQ plus community are going up in our world is not because more people are queer. Like that's not what's happening. What's happening is people have the freedom and the empowerment to say I'm queer or I'm trans right before. I mean, in some States, it's very tricky right now. And rights are at risk and like safety is at risk. And so people are still having to hide who they are. In some places where I live in in New York, you know, it's a lot more open. And so we're seeing more and more young kids say, Hey, I'm trans, you know, and, and that's a beautiful thing. And so we're seeing these numbers rise, not because there are literally more trans people, but we're seeing them because the trans people that are there are saying, hey, I'm trans. And that's the important piece. So just releasing the judgment around the norm being better. I don't even want to use that term because it's like so gross, you know? It's like, ugh. Yeah. So that that's where I would start is like acknowledging that this word norm doesn't mean normal is good. It means that that just has been the majority historically for decades. Exactly. And to your point of kind of the state of the world right now and so many rights being at risk, I live in Florida. So oh boy. I'm in one of those states <laughs> yeah. soon to be in California, but currently in Florida. And one thing that happened here recently was the parental rights of education. So there's yeah. this big debate on when we can start talking to kids about sexuality, when we can even explore that there are different gender is that gender is fluid and that it's okay to not know who you are at a young age and to explore who you are. Yeah. And I would love to know from someone who specializes in this, is it ever really too young to start having these conversations? And if it is, when is a good time to start it? It's a really good question. You know, it, there's never an age that is too young to talk about the things that are relevant to that age. So is it too young at five years old to talk about anal sex? Yeah, probably. Right. Like kindergartners don't need to like know that where they go poo poo is like also a pleasurable, right. Like we, that, and, but that's what people hear when we're like, let's bring sex ed to, to five-year-olds. They're like, we can't teach them about sex toys and anal. Like no one wants that. No one is pushing for that. No one needs that. What we can do though, is teach kids for appropriately for where they are developmentally. So a great example of this is kids on average start what we would consider masturbating at around 18 months old on average. Now they're not opening up their laptop, going to Pornhub and like masturbating until they orgasm. That's again, what people see when (laughs) we say this, but that's not what's happening. What's happening is you're at the grocery store, your kid is in the cart and they feel a little nervous or overwhelmed with all of the lights and people. And so they go to comfort themselves. And because kids don't have the shame yet, because shame is learned, yeah, they put their hand in their diaper and they're like, this is relaxing. <laughs> and they start touching themselves. It's not sexualized. It is 
comforting. Now that 18 month old or, you know, to however old, we do need to teach at some point that touching yourself in the grocery store isn't a part of our society, right? If they turn into a a 20 year old that's masturbating at the grocery store, they're going to get arrested based on our laws. Now, again, we don't need to tell an 18 month old about getting arrested as an adult. What we do need to talk about is encouraging body exploration, encouraging self-comfort, and also talking about where and when we can do that. And so it's not about shaming a child for touching themselves, which is frankly how most of us respond, right? Like our kids in the grocery store and we're like, oh my, get your hand out of your pants. Like I've heard that so many times. Get, I t- for the 18th time, Joey, get your hand out of your pants. And this kid is not going to hear, oh, we're in a public place. And my mom is trying to teach me that when I'm older, this won't be appropriate. What they hear is if I put my hand in my pants, I get yelled at and I'm doing something wrong. Exactly. So it's about teaching kids what is appropriate for them. There are girls, women, people with uteruses that start their menstrual cycles as young as eight. Wow. So if we're not educating people about menstrual cycles before eight, that human is going to be in the bathroom one day and pull down their underwear to go pee and see blood and think that they are dying. Yeah. And that is far more traumatic than learning about menstrual cycles. We can even teach about menstrual cycles without teaching about penetrative intercourse, yeah. right? Every month the lining comes there just in case there's a baby. If there's no baby, the lining comes out, done, end of story. Like it's, exactly. but we sexualize it as adults. We're like, oh, but if I tell them that, then we're gonna have to talk about condoms. And then we're, then we're on to anal. Like, it's, it's not that much of this quote unquote slippery slope. We can really address kids for the needs that they have when they're at specific ages. And then at some point we do need to like generally talk about, you know, puberty and hormones and what it's going to feel like for these kids who are then turning into teens who are going to turn into adults. And I think we forget that often. Like we forget that the, the child that we're talking to is going to like, you know, hopefully become an adult. And the, the messages that we're giving these kids, they need to be age appropriate. And we need to remember that they're going to become adults one day. And so teaching them lessons that are temporary lessons need to be in that framework. You know, this may change when you're older. Um, you may feel that way right now. It could change. It may not, you know, giving, but giving them the space to grow and evolve. It is so important that we allow kids the space, like you said, to grow, evolve and explore who they are. And it might change. It might not change how they feel comfortable with sexuality, gender, anything. It's all going to change. And some days you might feel more feminine, you might feel more masculine, you might never have any change, but why not let them explore? Yeah. Letting kids be kids is not about hiding the world from them. Um, you know, it, in, in some ways it is in the way of like, you know, we don't need to talk to a three-year-old about the Holocaust, right? We, we wait until they're, they're a bit older. Um, but we do need to talk to a three-year-old about racism right? Like if we're not talking about these things from when they're younger, when do we talk about it? And a kid can still be a kid with the knowledge of what's age appropriate for them in how the world works. You know, a a kid can be aware. Kids know so much. And what happens is, is they just decide for themselves or they don't think it's safe to ask. And they just start to assume. And what that does is gives the child this idea that they're going to have to assume 
things in life. And we know as adults that that's not a good strategy (laughs) for things, right? We don't want to assume we want to ask. Um, but if we don't create a safe space for these kids, they're not going to ask. Exactly. And a lot of behavior is learned behavior. So they're imitating the people around them. But what happens when those people aren't around anymore? What happens when they realize the person they were imitating was making some very just bad decisions or being very mean, being racist, being homophobic, just not accepting people, people who maybe just were ignorant towards what's going on. What happens when they realize that's the behavior they've been imitating and now they don't know who they are and they don't know if it's okay, like you said, to ask questions and what questions they're allowed to ask. Exactly. And that's the thing is that we want part of being a kid, if we're talking about kids being kids, part of being a kid is asking questions and being curious, right? Like, so if anybody has kids or like was a nanny or a babysitter or a teacher, like, you know, that why is one of the biggest questions that kids ask. And so many adults get so frustrated by this question. And it is so unfair of us as adults to be annoyed by a child asking why, right? Like, why is the sky blue? Why does that truck make more sound than that truck? Why does my body look different than my sibling's body? Why do I have red hair and you have brown hair, right? All of these questions are like them trying to navigate and figure out the world. And as adults, we have the responsibility to not just answer them because like, frankly, the answer is less important, but create the space for them to ask and not discourage, right? I Now there's a limit, right? So like my mom, for example, when she was growing up, she didn't get a lot of answers to her why questions. And so one of her, uh, you know, I want to change the way that like, the, you know, family system has done it. One of her things was like, I'm going to answer why, and I'm going to, I'm going to give space for that. And I was a very curious kid, shocking. Um, and so she actually set like a boundary around it. So I was allowed to ask why up to two times. And then that was it. Like I, I had to take her answer at that point. So like, mommy, why do we have to go to you know, this party today. Well, it's my friend so-and-so's birthday. Well, why, why, why do we have to go though? Well, it's my friend so-and-so's birthday and I want to go support her and she's really excited to see you. That's it. Like my question was answered, right? I could go on and be like, but why do I have to wear this dress? Or why are we in the car for so long? Like, nope, that's it. Like I got, I got the answer. And so there's a way to still set boundaries and, and, um, guidelines for your kids without having to be like annoyed when they ask you why, because if, if we respond with annoyance, they're just not going to come anymore. I absolutely love that your mom did that. I know for me, it was, if I asked why it was because I said so, Mm. and I never, All my ideas, beliefs, opinions came from what I was taught either from my parents or my teachers. It wasn't until I got to college that I started to question anything. For the first time in my life, I wasn't surrounded by people who believe the exact same thing as me. And my whole world was like, whoa, this isn't true. You don't have to be forced to bring a baby into this world you don't want to. You don't have to be straight because someone said you do you don't have to live according to these kind of I don't want to say I mean I guess norms but I hate that word yes so for kids who maybe were never allowed to ask why who never got answers and were grown up in a specific kind of point in time and that's what life is how can they begin to explore safely that's a great question (laughs) you know and that 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 is the question is that kids will find a way to explore And whether they are a little, little kid or an older child or a teen, they will find a way to try to get the answers to what they want. And the way that I look at it from an educational perspective is, do we want to be in charge of 
filtering and giving kids accurate information? Or do we want to risk that they go online, type in something in Google, find whatever comes up? Because we know that sometimes it's like totally accurate stuff. And sometimes it's like, why on earth would that pull that up, Google? Like what is happening? Even something that is technically accurate, but not age appropriate right? Google doesn't know that there's a seven-year-old behind the screen or a 12-year-old or an 18-year-old. They just know that they're typing words into Google. So like, they're not going to give the information that's like appropriate for the person Googling. They don't know that. We don't have to type that information in when we do an internet search. So one of the best things that we can do is to create a space that feels safe and that truly that truly feels safe to ask questions and to even, even possibly be wrong. Yes. Right. Like God forbid, <laughs> like that's space I wish I had growing up and hearing these conversations, listening to people like you being able to go on social media and actually find useful information and education yeah. that I never would have had access to before has been so amazing. But at the same time, in the beginning, it was so overwhelming because yes. I began questioning every single thing I knew, every piece of me, Yep. because suddenly the world wasn't black and white. I didn't know. I didn't know who I was anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's a mind fuck. It is. Like it is literally a mind fuck because if, if you grow up, if you grow up thinking uh, the sky is blue because um, little gremlins up in the clouds paint it blue every day, right? Like, let's just say that that's what you grew up with. And then you're in science class and they're like, so the sky is blue because da, 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 right? And explain the whole thing. You're going to be like, oh my God, what else do I not know? What else? was I given wrong information? And then all of a sudden we go on this, like you're saying, like, who am I? Am I even the person that people have told me I am? Which is the other thing is like a lot of times the same people, and this is generalization. I want to be very clear. The same people that don't create this space for the wise are typically the same folks who like to tell kids who they are without them letting them figure out who they are right? They try to like mold them and they're like, no, this is what it is. This is who you are. This is like no questions asked because I said so. Yeah. Like, well, mom, I don't want to wear my hair and pigtails. Why do I have to? Well, because I said so. What the fuck does that teach a kid? Like that, that, that child is again going to be in a relationship with someone in the future. And they're th that person could be like, I want to have sex with you right now. And they don't want to. And they say, well, why? And they say, because I said so. And we're teaching that child to just submit to that. Like as though consent is not a part of the world. Like we can help teach our children consent just by simply giving them the opportunity to consent yes. and modeling that. And letting them understand that they can ask for a container and a space to talk. You know, when I'm working with couples or quads or triads or whatever relationship formation I'm working with, one of the things that we talk about is asking for consent for conversation because often we blindside, right? And we like walk up to somebody, they're like emptying the dishwasher and we're like, so like our life savings, da, 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 da. And they're like, what the fuck? I'm like doing dishes. What are you talking about? And then that turns into a, an argument because someone's taken off guard and it's so much better to, you know, Hey babe, I want to talk about da, 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 da. When is a good time for you? And we can teach our kids to do this. Like, Hey mom, I have questions about sex. When can we sit down and talk about it? So then as the parent, you can then say, yes, honey, I would love to. How is tomorrow at 4 PM? And then you as the parent have that time to like prepare for the conversation. You don't have to have the conversation right when your child brings it up. You can teach them to ask for consent for a container and then come prepared both emotionally and with the information into that container. 
That's a beautiful way to start teaching consent. Again, that's an age appropriate way to teach consent without talking about penetration, without talking about sex. And that is so important, having these conversations with kids and teaching them without, again, bringing in that inappropriate stuff that they might not be ready for. Rachel, you've been absolutely amazing today. All the information that you brought us is incredible. I loved learning from you. Before we wrap up, can you share how people can connect with you? Absolutely. My website is rachelwrightnyc.com. So R-A-C-H-E-L-W-R-I-G-H-T-N-Y-C.com. Um, and then my Instagram is where I am primarily other than that. Uh, and that handle is the right underscore Rachel. 